Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want you to imagine that you're a rhino, a grandma rhino, and you've lived in Africa your entire life, and you can remember the times when rhinos could roam freely across the continent. But you also know that things have changed. It's not quite the same as it was, and something needs to be done. So you call your two oldest grandchildren and sit them down and you say, kids, it is no longer safe to be a rhino on this continent. The poachers are after us and they're getting us wherever they can. And they are getting more and more dangerous and more and more daring. And one of the kids says, but why, Grandma? And you say, it's because of your horn, and the bigger the better. And they don't care if you're attached to it or that it regrows, and we know that it's made up of nothing more than human fingernails, keratin. But they believe it has special powers. They believe that it can improve your sexual performance. They believe that it can cure anything from colds to cancer. They believe that it can prevent hangovers. We know that that's all, not all the case. And one of the kids says, but Grandma, not all humans are like this. Some are trying to help. And you say, that's quite right. Some are trying to help, but it's too little too late. If this continues, rhinos could become history. We need a safe place where we can live safely and bring up our young without any threats or dangers to them. There is a place, it's called Australia. It's far away, far, far away from where we are. But it's large and it's safe and they have experts there who know all about the way we live and the climate is very similar to what we have here. Moreover, you have family there. About 10 years ago, a group of rhinos went from Africa to Australia and they've done very well indeed. I want you to go take a group of rhinos with you to go and support the existing population of rhinos in Australia. And when the kid says, but Africa is our home, will we ever come back? I tend to get emotional, I'm sorry. And they say, and, and you say, Africa is in your blood, but I don't want your blood spilled all over Africa. This may take some time to resolve with these, with these poachers, and you may not come back here, but your children and grandchildren will come back and continue the heritage that we built up in Africa over millions of years. There's silence. It's a lot to take in. And one of the kids says, but Grandma, is this really possible? Ladies and gentlemen, um, I too am an African, as you can tell from my accent, I guess, although I've lived in Australia for 30 years now. I'm the founder of the Australian Rhino Project, and our goal is simply to establish a breeding herd of rhinos in Australia, which will act as an insurance against the possible extinction of rhinos in the, in the wild. Now, there should be a slide there. That's me with some, in case you can't tell. <laughs> so, um, the, um, I was a lot younger then, I think. Um, that photo is, is taken with me with a group of, of rhino orphans at a rhino orphanage in South Africa. So you may say, how do rhinos become orphans? Well, I'm about to show you. Now, the, the, the voice that you hear is of a South African game ranger. And I just warn you that some of the graphics are, are somewhat um, graphic. I was called to come and attend a scene. And the noises you are hearing, the squeaky noises, are of this one-month-old little baby. It's very traumatic for this calf. Traumatic in the sense that there's no response from his mom. By now his mom is cold already. She's been butchered. And for this young calf, he or she doesn't really understand quite what's going on. If 
you hear a rhino baby cry, it's just like hearing a child. I can tell you it's one of the most horrible things you'd ever hear in your life. In the past three or four years, 4,000 rhinos, 4,000 rhinos have been slaughtered for their, for their horns. In, a, in the last 30 years, there's been an unprecedented attack on rhinos in Asia and in Africa, and specifically for their horns. The rest, those that are left, are under severe threat. Now, I want you to have a look at this, and I, I think you'll agree, you, you have to agree, that, that a rhino is the closest that you'll ever see to a dinosaur in your life, and I'm sorry if you can't see if I'm in, in your way. This fellow, um, a rhino's been the planet for something like 20 million years, they say. This fellow, who's a woolly rhinoceros, and you can see the similarities are quite uncanny, um, inhabited the earth about two and a half million years ago. Sadly, because of the increased affluence in, a, in specifically Vietnam and China, more and more people are able to afford to buy rhino horn. Rhino horn on the black market will fetch $75,000 a kilogram. I'll repeat that, $75,000 a kilogram, that's twice as much as the price of gold. So you wouldn't be surprised that the international crime syndicates have taken an interest in this, and they are heavily involved in an industry which, if it's called an industry, is worth approximately $20 billion a year. These are the same, self same syndicates that move people around, we know all about that, that move drugs around, that move, what I missed, weapons around. It's the same people doing all the same things. And they say that there are 15 um, international crime syndicates operating in the Kruger National Park every day. <laughs> this is not an African problem, folks. This is a global issue that has to be resolved globally. We are members of the global committee and we have a com community and we have responsibilities to get involved and assist this thing on, on, on a global basis. And on that subject, I'd like to say to all the people in Africa, who are fighting this undeclared war. <laughs> you do not walk alone. Sorry, I knew I'd have some trouble with that. Um, you do not walk alone. It is a global issue. I'll tell you a little story about a friend of mine. He's, let's call him Pete. He is the security warden for a large and popular game reserve in South Africa. His responsibility is to take care of all animals, not only rhinos, but that's the focal point at the moment, as well as people. Well, one night he and his wife, called her Jenny, were asleep in their room. And two o'clock in the morning, the light went on in their bedroom. And there at the bottom of the bed, at the foot of the bed, were five guys standing, three with machetes, one with a gun, and the other fellow was unarmed. Now, Dave is a fairly healthy fellow. Was completely, he, there's nothing he could do because they were right in front of him. And their dog, who slept on the, on the carpet alongside the bed every night as protection, slept through the entire event. So he'd been drugged through this thing. Now, he wasn't sleeping because he was tired. He was sleeping because he was drugged. So... Um, they demanded, where's the horn, where's the horn, where's the horn? There was no horn in his house, as it turns out, but they wouldn't believe him, and this carried on for a while, and eventually, one of these guys jumped on his wife, and he said, he exploded. He said that was just one bridge too far. And he fought these five guys out of his house to the front and collapsed with 16 stab wounds to his body, a punctured lung. <laughs> his wife was also stabbed, but not seriously, but the little fellow who was in the bed the bedroom Alongside, then I knew about that. He slept through the whole event, thank, thank God. That just gives you the, a, a feeling for the kind of lengths to which people will go to get their hands on rhino horn. Um, this slide, just, I know you all know your geography very well, but if you look down, you'll see, obviously, Australia's here, Indian Ocean, then you have the continent of Africa. The part that we're talking about is Mozambique. Mozambique is the seventh poorest country in the world. And then you have the Kruger National Park, which runs literally down the, the border with Mozambique. No fences, obviously. From Mozambique is where most of the poachers come today. Seventh poorest country in the world, remember. They'll come over the border, let's say tonight, there'll be three of them. There'll be one with a big gun, with a the other one with a machete or an ax, or whatever he's gonna do to do the damage that you saw a little bit earlier. And the third fellow will come and he'll have other communications or, or food. Tonight's a good night because it's, it's almost full moon and they can, it's almost like daylight. They will run or walk across the Kruger National Park in the bush, which is sparsely, uh, sparsely populated because it's a, it's a national park. And there'll be elephants, lions, leopards, snakes, and rangers looking for them to a spot where they would have had a tip-off to say the rhinos are here because it's so, such a vast area the size of Wales 
or Israel, that they have to have a tip-off to find these things. You don't just run into a, into a rhino. That would not be a good thing anyway. So, um, and they go and they'll shoot the rhino, generally the one with the biggest horn because the return on investment, and they'll scurry back across the border into Mozambique. It's risky. Clearly it's risky because the, there are a lot of people trying to prevent them from getting to the rhinos. So they're prepared to risk their lives, these poachers, to make sure that they get this, this money. And the money that they would get for a night's work could be equivalent to up to two or three two or three years' salary to these guys. And some die. Yes, they do. I mean, a week ago, there was a ranger shot by a poacher, shot dead. And this particular instance I'm about to tell you about, one of the, one of the poachers had been, had been shot on his poaching errand, and the funeral was taking place in the village in Mozambique. And uh, there was a chap sitting, standing underneath a tree who was, turned out afterwards to be part of this, one of the crime syndicates. And as the, the funeral concluded, he went across to the widow and gave her her... Uh, a brown paper bag with essentially a, a financial bonus of sorts, saying that your, your husband is a wonderful man, and all we appreciate, and all that stuff. And then started to walk away. As he walked away, she said, Please wait, 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 don't go. I want to introduce you to my son, who wants to take his father's place as a poacher. I mean, it's horrific, quite frankly. Um, with the numbers of three or four being killed a day, there are many initiatives that are, try, are being tried. To, to arrest that, 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 or reduce that number. And the numbers are jaw-dropping. I mean, in, in 2015, there were 1,336 killed. 1,336 runners, that's like three a day. The previous year, 1,215. The previous year, 1,006. So we talk about a tipping point, which is on the graph behind me. That is basically when the kill rate exceeds the birth rate. So a rhino has a gestation period of about 16 months, it only drops one calf at a time, and the cow's ready again in around between three and four years. So there's a significant gap between calving. So something has to be done to arrest that slide, because if the, once that, that the, the kill rate is, exceeds the birth rate, it kind of goes like that. Many believe that the tipping point has already been reached. So what's our plan? When we started this three years ago, um, we thought it was fairly simple. We thought, well, We'll bring 80 rhinos across from South Africa, or Africa as it was, and establish them here in Australia over a period of four or five years. And that would form the, 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 the nucleus of a breeding herd, which, given safe conditions, could grow to the middle, mid-2020s to have a, a sizable breeding herd which would enable us to repatriate rhinos to Africa. That is our model. Rhinos belong in Africa. There's no question about that at all. But this is like a custodial agreement that we've we brought to the table that says, we'll look after them for a while until you guys sort the problem out, and then they're available to go back into, into Africa where they come from. So where are we today? Um, three years on, we have got the, in principle, agreement from both the South African and Australian governments. It's been hard, but they've been extremely supportive, no question about that at all. We're working very hard with the Department of Agriculture in Canberra to make sure there are no biosecurity issues, which you'd all be concerned about, and we are obviously concerned about, in terms of diseases or contamination to fauna and flora. Um, we're working with, with a number of airlines, because that's the biggest cost factor, and, the, and this is not an inexpensive exercise. So we're working with a number of airlines to bring the, the runners over from South Africa, fly them over from South Africa to Australia in business class, clearly. Um, <laughs> so, and... Um, so that, that's, that's, again, one of our hurdles. So there's anybody in the audience who works for the airline, come and see me. <laughs> so so um, I'm often asked the question, why do you think that Australia is safe? Well, we never say that Australia is safe. We always say that, we believe that Australia is safer than, in my view, pretty much anywhere else on the planet. Why, you would ask. Firstly, it's an island. So the, it's got natural borders. And secondly, the the biosecurity and quarantine laws that, uh, that Australia has are as stringent as anywhere in, in the world. And I think Johnny Depp would be able to work that out himself. <laughs> so, so another reason is that, is that there's no poverty as such here as there is in Africa or Asia. There's no corruption here as there is in, in parts of Asia and Africa. Um, and we've done studies to make sure that rhinos do not pose any risk from a, a, a climatic, not a climatic point of view, biosecurity point of view, such as, as camels and, and cane toads and rabbits and so on. So we've, we're very conscious of that particular one. 
The final one is, is, is that, uh, and then there's the second last one, is the community pressure. You know that Australia is huge, but countries in Asia and Africa, the wildlife areas are being squeezed by people, and that's one of the biggest issues. We don't have that issue, issue here in Australia. And the final one is, is that I really do believe that if one rhino was poached in this country, all hell would break loose. I really do believe that. I think that Australians would find that unacceptable, not 1,300 a year, just one. And that gives me, thank you for that. Um, Not for one minute do we believe that this is the answer. It is not the answer. It is an answer in a very complex situation which includes for food security and that type of thing. But we think if we can establish some strongholds, including in Australia around the world, which are protected and out of the reach by spreading the risk against the poaching, I think that that's a good thing. Um, there's a, an expression, I was in South Africa a couple of weeks ago, and there's an expression which is a new one I'd not heard which is being, being touted by the, the uh, international crime syndicates. It's called banking on extinction. So what it means is there's is an imbalance between the rhinos that are being shot and the horns that are being, being injected into the market. And the belief is that these, these people are, are holding onto horns in the belief that it'll be, rhinos will become extinct and then the price will soar. There's one fellow who is, um, I think he's, uh, let's not say where he's from, but he's on record as saying that he wants to own the last rhino horn, get that, amen. Um, anyway, so we think this is potentially a very powerful model where you take an, an, an endangered species out of the danger zone and put them somewhere where they're safe, they can breed and be nurtured, and then in time repatriate them to where they come from, given the, 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 the problems that are being sorted out. The Tasmanian devil example is an exact, ex excellent example of what's been done by the people here in Australia. That, that's been a real success, and we think that we can do the same thing. We humbly believe that we're doing something for the planet. And we, at the Australian Rhino Project, are determined to do everything in our power to prevent the extinction of rhinos in the wild. Certainly not on our watch. Who has the right to exterminate an animal that's been on the planet for millions of years? And who will they blame when all the rhinos are gone? We must succeed. Thank you.